got in the room, Councillor Edwards, Councillor Gittings, Councillor Davis, oh my God, I need to do this, Councillor Emerson, thank you, Councillor McEwen, you, you, this is your second meeting, isn't it? That's your first one. First meeting, welcome. Councillor Robinson in the room. And then I think we've also got with us Councillor McElroy. Are you with us? I can, yes. So I am here, loud and clear. Us, well done. And I think that's it in terms of members. Um, and then we've also got uh, Mr. Popham in the, um, in the room. We've got Mr. Graham in the room. Um, we've got Maria Grindley, who's um, online, um, uh, driving in. Mr. Harrington, leader of the council, Councillor Brock is with us. Adrian um, Balmer from EY is also with us. Mr. Carter's with us. Um, oh, Mrs. Yates, I beg your pardon, we've missed you in the room. Sorry, seeing right by my side. Annette Trigg, and I think that's everybody. Okay, so if you need to put your pyjamas on, could you please do it now? Otherwise, we'll make a start. <laughs> Yes, sir. Jack, can I just bring up a point of order? Of course. Um, I understand that observers, officers and members of the public might want to take part in this as a hybrid meeting. But I did believe that member and we were aware of the impression that the members of the committee needed to be here. So are there any members of the committee who are, or who are attending in a hybrid so basis? I think the answer is Councillor McIlroy is not here. I think I saw in the briefing note was they could attend, but they couldn't vote. That's correct, Chairman. So members who are joining remotely aren't in the room for the purposes of the quorum or voting, but can still join in the debate. Does that satisfy his answer? Can, uh, I, can I follow up that question? You, when, when's the last time we had a vote? Um, we do vote on things, but it tends to be to note a report or to receive a report. We tend not to have a division as such, but I suppose it's potentially possible. Like you, I can't remember the last time we did, so it's a slightly academic point. Um, yeah, well, yes, I was going to use it. Yeah, agreed, agreed. OK, so um, let us make progress. Um, so first of all, item one, declarations of interest. Does anybody have any? I think it's unlikely given the nature of the business of the evening. OK, non-recorded. Minutes of the last meeting, I've looked through these. The only thing that confused me slightly, if anybody else remembers, Mr. Wellham answering, a, asking a question. Well, I said to Michael Popham, I don't remember him being there. He wasn't. He, I think, had an injury. He didn't attend. I think he received a written answer, which so my memory wasn't completely sort of way off. So the rest of it all looks perfectly reasonable to me. Um, well, look, we, we do resolve things, Councillor Davis, so that, that implies, therefore, that we must vote on something. So that's that's um, that's a response to it. You can't have a resolution without a vote. Um, so if, if everybody's happy. So, yeah, okay, right. <laughs> so, yeah, so are we all happy to receive and, um, and um, I, I agree that the minutes of the last meeting. Great stuff. OK, thank you. Um, so we move on then to questions. I have, although we did receive a question for what it's worth, and I managed to sort of swerve that one, send it. Where did I send that? Um, it's somebody who's answered that. Councillor McCune, you're answering that one, aren't you? Not here tonight. You, I've been in a different committee. Yeah, yes, Chairman, the lead councillor's um, been uh, directed to that question for the next policy committee. Yeah, so I thought it wasn't a question for this committee, I think. OK, so no questions. So then we move to um, internal audit, annual assurance report, the, the first major report. And this obviously relates to last year, i.e. 2020, uh, 2020 Mr Harrington. Thank you, Chair. I'm presuming everyone can hear me and see you yes great good start right so for those of you who have been a member of the committee for some time you you will know that i have to produce um an annual report um providing my assurance opinion on the um internal control environment um and internal controls what is internal control it's governance and risk management so there's no sort of defined science behind my opinion i don't have to achieve a particular benchmark. I look at the number of audits we've completed, the opinions assigned to each area throughout the year and the significance of the area system process reviewed. So it's my professional opinion, it's my view, it's my judgment 
um, on the council's control environment based on the work of the internal audit team. The opinion does not imply that we've looked at or reviewed all risks relating to the organisation and the committee may wish to take assurances from uh, the council's external auditors and other um, independent reviews completed throughout the year. So the results of audits are reported to the committee quarterly, so nothing what I'm reporting in this report should come as a surprise. So if I can direct you straight to um, appendix one of my report, section 2.3, page 21. Um, you will see a little, oh, not little, but it's, it's, it's a red box. So this is my assurance of opinion. So I've concluded that only limited assurance can be taken that arrangements to secure governance. So, Paul, just slow down a moment because we're, we're all trying to use our PCs really science. Sorry, so, sorry. So, you're, so we've got a bunch, so I have got to bounce out of the main report into the appendix if that's what you want us to do. Yes, yes, please. Okay, so I, just, take, just take a bit more slowly because we can actually catch up with you. OK, I'm in the appendix. Sorry, page 21. Yeah. Section 2.3, my apologies. Right, um, so I've concluded that only limited assurance can be taken that the arrangements to secure governance, risk management and internal control within those areas audited in 2020-2021 are suitably designed and applied effectively. And this opinion reflects the fact that 45% of internal audit reviews completed during the year um, were assigned a limited assurance opinion. So the graph, which is uh, paragraph under paragraph 3.4 on page 25, this provides a visual trend of the number of uh, positive versus negative assurance opinions for individual audit reports since the, um, the financial year 16-17. And as you can see, the number of limited report opinions has increased slightly it's not gone down so this is one of the reasons why i can't give a more positive assurance opinion also so whilst i'm disappointed that the opinion remains the same as last year there are signs of improvement, and i think this needs to be recognized um, also so the reason why I've indicated that there's a positive trajectory in, in following improvement, this is following improvement initiatives such as the Finance Improvement Programme, uh, the significant improvement in implementation of historic recommendations since, since implementing the new tracking and reporting process. This is reflected in improvements in areas such as accounts payable, um, which for the first time this year has been given substantial assurance. Bank reconciliation, you will know if you've been a member of this committee for a number of years now, we've had concerns over the bank rec. That is now up to date and it's being completed. Um, and there's a reduction in the number of outstanding audit recommendations, which is reported to the committee each year. However, I've caveated that by stating that this improvement trajectory needs to be sustained over the next 12 months in order to reach a more positive um, opinion. So of particular importance in determining my limited opinion, it's not just the finance system. So although we still have concerns with accounts receive, receivable, which is um, saundry debts, I'm also still concerned over the reconciliations of uh, control accounts and feeder system reconciliations. I know that there are plans um, afoot to, to address these areas, but also there are a number of limited assurance um, areas outside of finance, um, such as sort of information governance, where we've needed, uh, where we've um, identified areas that need addressing within freedom of information, data transparency, and records management. Again, I'm given assurances, and I know firsthand that those recommendations are being implemented implemented, which again is positive. So some of the key areas for improvement identified during our audit work are set out in section four, which is on page 26 and 27. And these cut across other service areas um, across the council. These are reviews where limit assurance, limited assurance has been provided and improvements are needed. So section five of the report focuses on governance and risk management. However, my concerns predominantly stem from control aspects, um, but to a degree, all three are, are interlinked. 
section six of, of the appendix, which is on page 30 and 31, compares actual performance against planned performance. And section seven towards the end of the appendix shows the performance of the um, investigations team um, in comparison to two previous uh, financial years. So that is all I want to say. Um, any questions? OK, thank you very much for that. Obviously quite a lot to us to unpack there. Um, so does anyone in the room first all? So Councillor Dave, you go first. I'll start off. Yeah, um, thank you. It's a very, it's a comprehensive report. And as you say, it's nothing uh, individually. We have seen all these reports over the last year. Um, what it says to me, my takeaway is that actually the audit function is doing its job pretty well and we've seen it its work being done all, all year there's lots of detail here we've looked at all the right areas we've been we've managed to feed in areas you know we constantly revise and look at and agree areas um, with uh, mr harrington's recommendations of areas he's going to look at next etc um they, he comes up with recommendations we have a we have a table where they're, they're tracked uh, effectively so I think that shows that our process is is a good process I'm, I'm comfortable with that um, the uh, if you look at the table on 6.2.2 uh, there are some KPIs there things like production of final reports um, that are close to the target there are some that are the responses from management are way below the targets now that comes on to the second point, which is like, well, what are the results of these audits? So you can say, yes, the audit process itself we, we, we're doing we're doing OK with. Uh, and that's what the principal um, responsibility of this committee is. But if you look at the substantive, the information coming out of the audit to indicates that actually there's a kind of worsening um, position there, because over the last three years, there's actually been an increase in the numbers of uh, internal reviews that have not yielded a positive result and that's got to be a concern Sorry, Chair, I, I can't hear a thing. No, apologies, my thing. So I just said again. So basically, what I'm saying is, what is? I think we, we obviously we focused on the percentages, which you reported clearly is in your bread box report. What I'm saying is actually, if anything, what I noticed that if you look at the actual numbers at 3.2, you've done slightly fewer audits this year. So the number of limited sources is about the same as previous years, but because you've done fewer audits, relatively is a greater percentage. And actually, had you knocked out two or three more audits and they've been of a higher caliber, then probably in a better place. But that's that Thank not you. to sort of. Yeah. I mean, you could look yeah. at it the other way and say, yeah. well, the number of substantials and reasonables has declined. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, um, uh, so it's just that, you know, I think it, 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 mm. we're, we're, it, we're all about transparency. We're not, we're mm. not, um, you know, we say that a number of times in this, in this uh, committee. So, so we're, you know, we, we, we want to see these things. We want to, we want to add yeah. things to the tracker. We want to see them moving through. Um, on the other hand, we also want to see more uh, positive positive audits ideally so, so, so i think for me um that obviously tells a story and the really big thing is for us is that was just, just disappointing it's not as good as we'd hoped it to be this year but then we know all sorts of things have been going on this year frankly it's an absolute nightmare of a year the key thing is in terms of the performance improvement program is there a good sense i'm looking at mrs yates here and perhaps darren is, are things really improving at a rate that we're happy with are they resourced are people responding the way you want them to thank you chair um if i can um i think that the first thing to reflect on is that when we draw up and paul draws up the audit plan and brings it to the corporate management team and then to this committee actually what we're trying to focus on are those things where um, either we haven't done a piece of work for some substantial period of time um, or we think 
that there may be some risks associated with it that we want to get to the bottom of. So, for example, the, the governance area would be a case in point where we have put particular focus on those areas because actually we want to understand better the position and as a learning organisation, we want to then pick those things up and, and work with them to improve them. So I think de facto in terms of how the plan is pulled together, clearly there are some big financial um, areas that will always be looked at but otherwise yeah. um we're time trying to focus in on where do we think the risks are um let's have a look at this let's see what's going on and try and satisfy ourselves of assurance um but in the cases where you know we haven't got substantial assurance then it is about learning from that and putting those things in place so so inevitably there there is there is that um i think from my perspective um you know the last 12 months have been a very challenging year um, for everybody. And I suppose in terms of Paul's team completing audits, then actually fighting for time with service managers who are also trying to deliver frontline services um, in very trying circumstances, it does make getting responses sometimes a bit more difficult, getting people's attention a bit more difficult. And it's fair to say that um, management responses historically hasn't been great. It's an area we have tried to, to work on and will continue to do. But I think there have been some exceptional circumstances this year. Um, but in terms of overall, then I, th I think, you know, I, I'll come on to it uh, when we talk about the audit tracker, but we are seeing traction in the organisation, as Paul has indicated, in terms of people picking up recommendations and moving those through to conclusion and improved reporting next time round. In terms of key financial controls and systems, I think I was perhaps hoping for a better out outcome this year. It, it, was this expected? Do you think that's where you thought we we're going to be? Um, because obviously that's the key thing in terms of audit and external audit. I, I am always hoping for improved oh. outcomes. I think um, that there, there's something about separating um, the the external audit of our accounts from from everything else we know that we've had some particular issues around controls and governance um, that have been going on in finance we know we've got finance transformation plan in place to address those things and we have seen as paul's indicated some in, um, very good improvements in those areas where we have had a focus. You know, audit reports come through and throw something else at us, which actually wasn't the, for, the, the focus of the transformation programme. And indeed today, um, Darren and I were discussing, actually, we need to be picking these up and thinking about, actually, they're not part of the original transformation programme. We need to make sure that the service is acting on these and, and how we get, what's, what's the mm. process for mm. so. OK, um, should we bring in Councillor Makuro at this point? Because I think you want to speak. Hi, thanks, Chair. I, I wanted to say thank you to um to the officers in, in doing this work and also for answering my questions um, during the week. I found it very helpful and has got me up to speed on what is my first um, audit and governance meeting. So um, I had two two parts on this and I'll try and quickly to get through get through them um, and not waste anyone's time. But my first one that I wanted to raise um, in the report, it does discuss about staff turnover, and I just, I just think that from reading it, you can see that there's genuine concern there about staff turnover and the um, the impact that this is having not not only on on the team getting this work doing, but um, particularly in the context of of this being a very challenging time that we're working on, and so. I just wanted to really, you know, bring that to the committee's attention. I noticed that that Paul hadn't raised it, and I wanted to to make sure that we heard um, that there is there is that concern that Claxon is being being rung, and I'd like to see see us doing not just a lot to fill any empty places, but to also make sure that we're doing our best to retain um, an existing staff, and where we fail to do so, to make sure that there's you know some sort of systematic exit interview process in place for realising. Right. Um, uh, with teeth for realising the benefits for those interviews. I'll, that was just a, a comment, but to go so on do you to... Do you want to pause at that point? Do we just have a response? Yes, on sure. What be worth what's talk about turnover and retention and so on? Yes, Chair. Um, clearly, um, 
we are we do have areas of the council um, that we have higher turnover in um, and some of that is um, not unexpected. I think it's fair to say that in terms of turnover across the council, um, we would probably be on a par with other local authorities. In certain areas it is higher and recruitment can be difficult, particularly in areas like finance and IT and um, other um, sort of technical specialist areas. Um, we do have exit interviews and um, our HR colleagues have got uh, plans in place with across directorates to uh, make sure that those are being recorded. Um, our iTrent system has been upgraded to enable those to be recorded um, because clearly as has been identified that can uh, enable you to understand uh, root causes sometimes for why people are leaving and provide some additional insight. Um, so we are doing everything we can to try and uh, retain people, certainly through the last 18 months or so, um, the duration of the pandemic. There have there has been lots of activity to try and keep staff engaged. Um, we do know from the staff survey that um, the vast majority of our staff enjoy working for the council. They feel, um, you know, that um, their team is very supportive and, and they feel that they're making contribution to the council. But clearly um, we can't always retain everybody in all areas. Mm -hmm. OK, so do you want to move on to your next point? Oh, right, sorry, Dan, do you, do, you, do you want to comment on that as well? Right, so uh, Mr. yes, Mr. please. Carter, you speak first, then we go back to Council McElroy. Yeah, I mean, the, this particular issue of turnover is, in, in terms of the finance team, it's not particularly permanent staffing uh, that are leaving. What we've got is a turnover of agency workers within the team. We, we don't have a particularly high number of agency workers, but some of the key posts within the team are filled by agency staff and we are struggling to recruit. So two, two of our key posts within the team, uh, we've been out to recruit last month and the closing date has now passed and we've had no mm. interest in anybody applying for the role at all. Uh, this isn't just a, an issue for Reading, it's an issue across the sector. Um, there was a recent SIP for Penner forum uh, specifically about this issue, about the problems of recruiting to uh, key finance posts in local government, but it is definitely an issue that we need to focus attention on trying to fix. OK, thank you for that. And then Councillor McCoy, you want to go back to your second point? Yeah, cheers. And uh, just to tie, tie Put a line under that one. I guess as a, as a councillor, I recognise that you know I have a, a role in contributing and alleviating a lot of the staff pressures. So I'm, I'd really hope that anyone within RBC who had any feedback for for me or any of my fellow councillors felt empowered to to give that to us and and let us know what we could be uh, doing to be to be more constructive. So I guess that's just an open call. On my on my second point, um, chair, I wanted to um, get on to. Um, talking about financial controls, which I think um, Paul was alluding to as a, as a particularly important part of his assurance review and, and to focus in particular on children's services. So recognising that, you know, back in 2017-18 recommendations were made for improvement um, in financial reporting. Um, and then the 2018-19 external auditors report that we'll get to later in the agenda says that while there are signs of improvement, um, with regard to financial reporting, ultimately the deficiencies in the system were still in place um, in that year. And now I guess we see in this um, annual assurance report um, that at the time of the, the audit of intercompany transfers um, for Brighter Futures for Children, the internal audit auditors identified approximately 2 million um, of accounting entries that needed further investigation and correction. And to quote from the report itself, we found it difficult to confirm the completeness and accuracy of payments as there were delays in payment and poor reconciliation controls to understand what had been paid and when. And that's quite a large number to not know exactly what had been paid and when. And, and, and now I understand that, that we think a lot of these are just errors, they're not evidence of fraud. However, given the size of this, you know, this two million and the size of um, the Brighter Futures for Children budget more broadly and how 
RBC is currently failing to meet some of its obligations regarding the government's transparency code. Um, our apparent vulnerability to fraud here makes me feel quite ill. Um, so I guess my question um, to the officer, I'd be interested um, to hear either Paul or both Paul or Darren's opinion on this. But yes, it appears that the audits are working. Um, but are we realising the benefits of these audits, at least for brighter futures for children? Because it looks like these issues that are being reported here, Paul, are the same ones that have been cropping up for a few years now. So um, okay. I guess my question is, do you have anything else you'd like to, to say on, on, on why this is still happening and, and what has okay. been done to fix these controls? I think first can we go with Mr Harrington, because I think you've somewhat paraphrased what he, he reported. So perhaps Mr Harrington, can you just restate what the things that you actually were reporting in summary? Yeah, so for this particular asp aspect, uh, uh, Councillor McElroy is identified. This is the intercompany um, transfers between Reading and Brighter Futures for Children. Now, at the time of our audit, which I believe was six plus months ago, it might have been slightly longer, I can't remember off the top of my head, we had concerns over the 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 the, the journal control in terms of evidence in the, um, the, the journal control. And this is where we get to this, this, this two point million um, in terms of evidence, evidence in um, th those particular journals. So we had real concerns over the governance and the control of the journals for the um, intercompany billing between the, 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 the two organisations. And that was reported to the committee, I think approximately um, six months ago with a, a limited assurance report. In terms of the financial controls for Brighter Futures themselves, they're subject to a separate audit plan and they have their own um, audit committee and I report to them uh, separately. OK, so that's the sort of the um, the audit findings and that was, we say, six months ago. So can we then say how things have changed, moved on, been resolved since then? It looks like Mr Carter's come up. Yes, yeah, so we're working on introducing much more robust processes uh, for ensuring the quality of the evidence attached to journals uh, processed by Bright Brighter Futures on behalf of RBC. Um, we haven't finalised the detail of that process yet. Um, as Councillor uh, McElroy um, mentions, it's actually raised in EY's report as well. And when we've written the management uh, comments, the management response to EY's report, I'll, I'll bring the update back to audit committee at the end of September. That will include details of how we've strengthened that process. OK, that's useful. So the issue is still not completely resolved. There are still matters outstanding, albeit they're being attended to. That's that's helpful. OK, Councillor Robinson. Thank you, Chair. I'd like to focus in, if I may, on 5.1.7, which is about the cyber security training. Sorry, that, are we uh, in the appendix now, the main report? We're in the appendix, I okay. believe. Yeah, page 28, and it's uh, paragra um, paragraph 5.1.7. It mentions about the cybersecurity training, and obviously I remember this because I found it hard going uh, using the system. I had to keep coming out and going back in and coming out and going back in. However, um, it's a bit shocking so many months after that to see that, um, you know, there are still some that have not completed this. Um, given that I take it it is compliance training of sort. Um, do we have figures or the, the percentage as to those councillors who have completed? Uh, because certainly it would be good to put, um, you know, a degree of pressure, you know, especially as councillors should be uh, leading the way in terms of uh, pause there, of this. because yep. all this is in a much a little later report in the governance report isn't it and i would suggest we park okay. it for the moment and pick it up in the governance report where, where indeed those those tables no are problem on. okay and i think there's a number of us want to ask questions about that too fair, fair observation of course so it's kind of a bit of a point of order i guess um this is a summary of audits from the last year yep right so Let's not discuss the audits of the last year that we've already discussed. I mean, I think people are right to move on and to, to talk about the progress. And it's later in the late in a later report tracking the progress uh, against these. But we have discussed these over the last year, the actual findings of the report. So this is a kind of summary. Uh, yeah, that's that's my. Uh, I, I think that's right. But it, but it, but it is, it is an end of year assessment. This is our end of year report. And the fact is in the red box, it's saying limit assurance. So I think it's not unreasonable people are 
questioning you know well, how much assurance can we then place on these various particularly the key systems so i think that's that's the sort of the conversation some of it i think is, you know, towards the edges but yeah that's the fundamental point I, in my mind so what 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 is the end of term report which is what you reported here okay that's that was what it was at the end of um march 21 and we've had for now through how are things then evolving or moving on since that and we hit and reports and later in the, in the meeting i think we'll really start to get into I think that's what i, I take your really. point there's tracking reports later on that yes do the yeah. same thing really. yeah it's probably what the people are getting at i think OK, so yeah, definitely some um, casual, but we'll come back to your point about um, the training. Exactly. We, we will pick that a bit later. Any more? Um, so I think what. Oh, sorry, apologies, right? Sorry, um, yeah. not a question, really. I just wanted to say I'm um, obviously a really interesting report, and I just wanted to thank all officers for such a thorough report. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, especially as obviously under such trying circumstances of the last year with so many staff absences and things so just to recognize that and say thank you to officers thank yeah you. okay so what we're asked yeah what we're asked to do is to note the assurance opinion given by the chief auditor and consider the issues raised in the annual report <laughs> which we did we have been doing i think okay so we all have to note it report duly noted okay thank you um okay so that, that was item four and then we go on to um Item five, internal audit quarterly progress report. So this obviously is the first quarter of this current year. Mr. Harrington, could you do you think when you're re referencing, could you refer, do you think, to paragraph numbers? Because the page referencing you were using was different from the pages I've got on the screen in front of me. So paragraph numbers, I think, are obviously consistent, but you were, um, we're all using different reference page references. OK, yep. I will do, Chair. <clears throat> so I'm focusing on the cover report, um, agenda item number number five. Um, so this is my standard quarterly report, just giving you an o giving the committee an overview of those reviews, audit reviews completed in the last quarter between April and June 21. Um, three audits reviews received a positive assurance opinion and one received a negative opinion. Um, and in addition to that, we signed off for grant um, certifications. So in terms of the substantial assurance opinions, um, that is NNDR and council tax, we concluded that this is um, well administered and is functioning effectively, despite the increased workload that has been placed on the service as a result of COVID-19. Later on in the report in the appendix, which I come to in the moment, there is there is a table on, on the plan for the year. So as part of um, the work we do on NNDR, we've also over the past 12 months, we've been looking at the, um, the payments being made, the, the business grants which have been made. Um, we're going to report our findings um, in September, but again, that's looking very, very um, positive. So again, it's a really well run, um, a good, good process. So we're happy with NNDR and council tax administration. In terms of reasonable assurance opinions, we've looked at commercial services. Um, and we concluded that there's an appropriate governance structure in place for the oversight of commercial activity. Uh, uh, also, we've given reasonable assurance to the general ledger. Um, we concluded that there's been a significant improvement in the journal processes on Oracle Fusion. But again, um, we've noted that the journal control for interne intercompany accounting between RBC and Brighter Futures is lacking, which we previously discussed. And then the one limited assurance uh, review is on the Mosaic system. Um, it's, it's the financial um, payment system on, on Mosaic. So Mosaic is, is a system we use for adult social care payments. Um, and we were looking at the, the timeliness of, of purchase orders um, raised to see whether they've been raised in a timely manner, which they haven't been, and then we were reconciling those to supply, uh, supplier invoices. And the detail of that report is attached as an appendix to this report. I think that's appendix number two, so that's the complete audit report. So as you'll be aware that for all limited assurance reviews, we attach the, um, uh, uh, the, the final audit report. Then the three grants we've signed off. So for certain grants, the, um, the head of paid service and the chief auditor are required to um, sign and return a declaration that the grants have been paid in accordance with the um, grant conditions. 
and the grants we've looked at, um, the four grants, emergency active travel grant, travel demand management grant, compliance and enforcement surge grant and the community testing grant. All of those grants were signed off and complied with the grant determination conditions. And then paragraph 3.73, um, if you see that there's a sentence which ends in mid flow, mid flow you can just, that, is, that should have been deleted. It says therefore and for, and nothing follows that. That should have been deleted. So the detail is in appendix one, which starts, um, yeah. yeah, starts on 43, and I'm going to go down now to, uh, I'm going to have to go by page numbers here, sorry Chair, but it's page sorry. 51. It's the table on Appendix 1, so that shows you the audit plan, it shows you the work we've completed in um, quarter one, a lot of it is finalising reviews which were carried over from last year's plan, so a lot of these are, are now issued final reports, they've been finalised, but and that also then goes on to show you the work that we got planned um, for the this financial year. And as I say in Appendix 2 is the um, complete re uh, report for the Mosaic payment controls, and I'm just asking that the committee note the report. OK, thank you for that. Three hats points to Councillor Emerson who picked up the typo. Well done. Um, I suppose just to start with, for me, for Mosaic is the one that concerned me most, and I think you seem to be particularly concerned. And the idea that seems to be was at 2.8 million of supplier prepayments. So my understanding that is we're overpaying prematurely or prepayments to suppliers unnecessarily. Why would we be doing that? Due to the, um, the, the pandemic, um, the COVID pandemic, at the beginning of the last financial year, we were paying um, providers in advance. Um, so what we would do, obviously that, that leaves an, a fraud risk, there's a fraud risk associated with that. So that's where our testing was. And at March 21, there was 2.8 million. Um, that's a significant balance, which we, we required further explanation from um, the the, um, the finance team, but there's no evidence of any fraudulent payments. So, so will that unwind and come back down again as we go back to more normal times? Yes, Chair. Um, certainly um, the council received some government directives that it should be supporting uh, local businesses and making prepayments wherever possible. And um, adult social care providers were one of the areas that um, we had specific um, direction around in terms of making prepayments yeah. too. So, so as we uh, step back from the pandemic, that should all unwind. Okay, yeah. Anybody else? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, obviously, share your concern that, well, that the mosaic point is the is the only one that, with, that doesn't have a, a a good a good report really. So. Uh, Good to see the actions, get some actions to come come through on that. Um, I would just just on uh, 2.5, 2.6, 2.7, 2.8. I didn't quite, although uh, Paul Harrington has now explained that, I didn't quite understand why they didn't have um, like, you know, assurance um, uh, uh, levels, but now I do. Um, those, so because they, those are interesting because they're all um, having, they're all an uh, extraordinary circumstance kind of processes because they're all related to the pandemic, aren't they? Um, and those presumably have had to have been kind of set up and uh, are they kind of unusual processes, done something one off? Um, I, I got the sense that some of these things were um, the council had to come up very quickly with proposals to, ex to enable us to accept certain grants. I know the transport thing was kind of a, uh, we, we were given very short notice about um, having a, certainly the first tranche of transport grants. Uh, and I think there was a, a lot of work and I think it should be recognised and done in trying to make sure that we could accept as much as we could of that, whilst keeping it compliant with the purposes that the grants were supposed to be, um, were supposed to be for. Um, so I, I think it's sort of, it's sort of impressive if that's been done well. And with, there are some recommendations that uh, Paul Harrington's made uh, as he mentions in here, but effectively he's basically certifying all four of these. I think it's worth mentioning that like in response to something extraordinary, officers have had to come up with things quickly to, and what they've done it for is the benefit of, it, of the community to be able to accept grants which were really important for us to get at the moment. So yeah, that's good.
Apologies, sorry, I'm not on. So, Councillor Brock, you'd like to speak. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Just to remind you all to use your microphones when you speak, otherwise it's like being in a, a sort of painful period of purgatory over here in the magic box. But anyway, I just wanted to thank uh, colleagues in internal audit for their very swift work in conducting the audits around those four COVID grants that Mr Harrington mentioned, and indeed to thank all of the officers involved in assessing and disseminating those grants. I mean, it was an awful lot of work to do in a very short period of time. And I think um, across the council throughout the pandemic, the team has worked incredibly well to make sure that funds got out the door, went to those that needed them, funded the kind of work that was needed across Reading. And it's really pleasing to have positive audit reports around those as well, accepting you know, the, the recommendations that Mr Harrington has made, uh, which I'm sure will all be carried out as well. But good to see that there's assurance around all of those grants. And to echo as well some of the comments that have been made about the payments to care providers in particular during the pandemic. I mean, I think it's difficult to express how much pressure the council was under, both from government and from providers themselves to ensure that payments went out to care providers very quickly. And I think it's fair to say, and I mean, the deputy chief executive will certainly be aware, she was very much involved in all of those discussions, that it was a matter of survival for a great many of those providers. And I'm very, very pleased and proud of the way in which we managed to uh, ensure that that money got out the door. Accept and acknowledge, of course, the concerns that Mr Harrington has uh, expressed. And, uh, you know, I hope that they're all uh, acted upon as is appropriate, but of course, look forward to more usual circumstances returning as we move forward as well. Thank you, Chair. Okay, no, thank you very much. Um, anybody else? So I, th I think really much appreciate that. And I think also the explanations are so helpful as well because it makes, so, uh, I'm on, aren't I? I am on, yeah, I think so. It makes you know, so much clearer for us to understand what's going on. So I think on this one, we're just asked to consider the report. So if we're happy, we're duly considered. Um, so that was five. Right, now we're getting to, so what we were sort of discussing a bit earlier, implementation of the finance improvement programme. Um, so I think I've got our lead officer, Chris Tidswell, is going to speak about this, and he has done previously. Here he is, we've got him. Good evening, Chair, um, um, and good evening, everybody. Uh, this is the, the next iteration of the update uh, for the committee on the implementation of the finance system improvement programme. Uh, the report takes you through some background uh, uh, and for, for members to remind them that the improvement programme has two phases. The first phase is about building the basics as part of the programme. Uh, and that follows six work streams around accounts payable, receivable, chart of accounts, reconciliation, final accounts and the finance system. Uh, in terms of a, a short update, the report ha has more detail. Um, accounts payable, accounts receivable, uh, and the chart of account work streams are now moving towards completion. Uh, the majority of deliverables have been completed and the last element is around developing the monitoring and reporting arrangements so that those changes that have been put in place actually happen and continue uh, and the, the, the transformation board will continue to receive results on uh, key performance indicators for each of those areas. Uh, and as already been mentioned, um, the recognition of the work as part of that program for the recent internal audit review of accounts payable, which uh, resulted in a positive assurance commentary, uh, which is really welcomed. Uh, the final accounts and reconciliations work is covered under, or certainly progress around those two areas is covered as part of the, uh, the, the agenda for this evening. Uh, the board continues to oversee the program uh, and the, the final area as part of that program under phase one is the, the replacement of the finance system. Phase two of the programme starts to build on those first foundations, which is talking about then looking at corporate financial management and governance. And, and the timing is, is entirely right to be alongside the implementation of the new finance system, because that will work then across the organisation with finance and budget holders around good and sound financial management in aligned with, with best practice. Uh, We've also included as part of the, the finance transformation programme, those audit recommendations that you've been talking about earlier as part of the tracker uh, that relate to elements within the finance transformation programme. 
uh, and for all of those there's been a positive move in terms of numbers moved away from red into amber and into green. Uh, the paper then talks about in more detail for each of those um, the number of deliverables and, and in particular um, the audit tracker recommendations. So uh, to quickly go through in the accounts payable, uh, there's one in progress, which is about uh, reconciling RBC and Brighter Futures um, as part of the final accounts piece. Uh, the audit tracker recommendations uh, are now eight on green, nine on amber, uh, and there are none on red. So uh, the report shows the previous number that were reported. Uh, accounts receivable, again, uh, we've got five in progress. And again, those have been highlighted earlier, which are around looking at the historic debt levels and debt reporting arrangements, developing a service level agreement for uh, accounts receivable, uh, and then training and, and monitoring uh, performance against those. For the audit tracker on that one, there, there are four recommendations, three amber and one a green. Uh, chart of accounts has, has one left in progress. And again, this is, it was mentioned as part of uh, uh, the Chief Internal Auditor's report, which is around um, codes uh, and particularly in the use of, uh, of holding codes. There have been a number of code reductions has been reported in the past. Uh, and these now that are left relate to non-grant holding codes which will be closed as part of the the final accounts progress uh, and the recommendations around the audit tracker uh, are too green so there's uh, non outstanding and the last one of those should be complete because it's it's 76 percent or more as i've mentioned earlier the reconciliation of final accounts will be covered under under a separate paper uh, and the final element of, of this particular phase of the work stream is the finance finance system so we've been through a, a formal procurement process, which I've reported in the past. Um, the contract was awarded to Advanced. Um, that contract has now been signed uh, and the organisation as, as in Advanced and also Reading now are putting together the implementation part of that plan uh, and mobilising resource to start uh, as far as I'm aware next month. So it should start in August with a go live date of the 1st of April next year. Uh, and there are no recommendations on the audit tracker. Chair, I'm happy to to take any questions. OK, super. Thank you very much for that. Um, so for those of us really passionate about this particular piece of work, it's so important that all this is happening. And I, I you know, get great, great comfort, comfort for the fact that we're making good progress here. Um, I've got a couple of thoughts. Anybody else want to go? Because maybe you want to start. Well, just uh, thank you, Chair. Just general comments, really. Uh, firstly, Chris, Tidswell looks like he's on a witness protection program. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, thank you for Jacko that. Want to remain anonymous? You don't need to remain anonymous, Chris. This is this is a good report. I would I would not be anonymous. Yeah. But um, this particularly satisfactory uh, is that is that um, we you know it's well recorded, well well known and publicised that we've you know financial controls have been a have been a bugbear of this council for several years and um, all the all the audit things we we know about. So I think I get the, this financial improvement problem program was a response to that. Um, so it's you know seeing this coming shows that it's not just about you know finding out where we've we've had problems. It's it's actually tracking real improvements that we 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 want we're seeing, um, and uh, it's great to see things moving from dark grey to a different grey to a different grey, um, and that's 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 great. I mean right to left perhaps is the easiest way. Um, and um, I guess, and, I, and this is, I guess, this is the question: If we've identified the right actions to do in all these work streams, the results are that the audit, yes. it, both internal and external, will improve. Yeah. And that's that's the way, that's the ultimate and uh, yeah. uh, manifestation of of this if it's done right, isn't it? And that, that's the sort of question. Really. So, so can I just add to that point? Because exactly where I got to was with obviously this is great, a lot of activity, hopefully how do we have the assurance or how do you receive assurance that actually this is being properly implemented it works and it works entirely because i think just to finish on that my, my concern is we tend to get the internal audit reports on all the main key financial systems right always on q4 right at the very end just before the year end and then it's very frustrating so suddenly oh no limited assurance again it'd be really frustrating if this stuff all sounds great then mr harrington does his report right in sort of back end of the year and oh no actually there's still problems here and there we've still got limited assurance can we get some interim audit work or how do we get assurance sooner rather than later 
Yes, Chair. So, so I guess there are a number of, of ways around that and certainly you'll be aware that historically um, I have requested uh, Mr Harrington's team do interim re uh, work around journal testing on a periodic basis to make sure um, it is as robust as we would wish it to be and that it stays robust and and um, that's been reported on in the past so so bringing internal audit colleagues um, in to look at specific pieces of work in terms of the board that oversees this transformation piece um, I, I chair that. Um, I, Paul uh, Harrington and one of his audit colleagues also sit on that board. And so in terms of uh, shaping and guiding the work that is going on, those work programmes, um, internal audit are part of that from the word go. Um, and um, I have um, sought to um, make sure that they're engaged at a variety of different stages, whether that's um, signing off um, documentation of processes, um, for example, around um, accounts payable, or whether it's being involved in um, the specification for the new financial system and taking part in some of those um, beauty parades, if you like, and an evaluation ar around of, of the financial system uh, tenders. So, so there are a variety of ways. And obviously, on a day to day basis, um, Darren has got oversight of, of the finance yeah. team um, and um, with his management team, making sure that these things are embedded and that reporting that comes through to the board is, is robust. Sorry, everybody. Um, sorry. So just to say, so it's a reasonable expectation that if it's all embedded, very closely monitored as we go over the next sort of six, nine months, by the end of the year, we will get a solid re assurance from internal audit and hopefully um, external audit will equally be happy about our processes. I would certainly um, hope that we have made um, further progress on where we are. I'm not saying yeah. that there won't be um, the odd issue still to be resolved, but absolutely we will have made significant progress from where yeah. we are now. Councillor Emerson. Yeah, I was just going to point out, Chair, the previous report um, notes both accounts receivable and accounts payable is coming up as um, internal audits in quarter two and quarter three. So I suspect the committee will be speaking about those in the next couple of meetings, which are two out of the six work streams. OK. Super. Anybody else? Councillor McIlroy. So we're asked at 2.1 to note the progress of the financial programme and we duly note it. Thank you. Well, no, it's been noted. No. Um, so next one is seven, which is the information governance quarterly update to be Mr Graham. And this will pick up your point, Councillor Robinson. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I'm back with a further report to give you some updated information about what's happening in terms of information governance. So we've presented a report and uh, a, an, an appendix, which effectively then is uh, the first time I think we've brought some information to the committee, giving full details of our yearly response uh, on a number of different information items, which I'll come to um, in just a moment. So the points I'd like to direct your attention to in the main report, first of all about FOI cases, to give you an update on that about the new case management system, which had been trailed for quite some time, then went live in March 2021. I think it's fair to say there were some um, teething problems in terms of its operation, but it broadly it was working as it was expected to do, but obviously everybody has to get used to it. Um, there is a there are further details in the appendix report, so I'll come back to FOI numbers because I've got some further updated information again, which isn't in the uh, which isn't in the appendix report as well. But just wanted to sort of remind councillors that generally we're trying to get to a level of performance, which is the expected good response from the information commissioner, which is about 90 percent of these being sent out in time. So in relation to some other items where we've progressed, the data transparency um, code, um, a lot of that information, apart from a couple of data sets now, 
is all ready to go onto the, the web. Most of it's now on the web. Um, and we've reviewed that today in the Information Governance Board, and we're happy with progress on that. We'll be able to meet the uh, targets in the um, in the audit recommendations. Our members will also recall that there's a follow-up audit in that area scheduled for, I think, quarter three or quarter four this year. In the Information and Governance Board, a number of security policies are being reviewed and good progress has been made on all of those. And um, we will be keeping an eye on those policies now on a regular basis. So the information strategy is noted will be coming forth policy committee in the autumn. And then in relation to the, um, the uptake of cyber security, this is obviously something which members were very keen to look at and I provided a further set of uh, information and details in the report. So we've now managed to have a, a further small improvement in the number of councillors who've uptake, uh, have taken the training at 27, 59%. And the officers has again gone up um, by a small margin as well from 33% up to 50%. So it's still not satisfactorily uh, satisfactory overall. So again, further discussion has been had in the board today about ways in which we can uh, move this with a combination of carrot incentives and sticks by which to um, poke and prod people into the required uh, performance. So we've got a range of measures which are which are ongoing to improve that performance. But it is it is a real risk for the council. It, it has been noted in uh, in the local press as well. I'm you know reliably informed that it was picked up in the Reading Chronicle that we um, our performance here wasn't good. So we should reassure um, public as well as uh, as ourselves that, um, that we we are actually taking this as a very serious and real risk because other councils have suffered cyber security events and it is something which we're looking at and we're doing some work around the resilience of the council on cyber security as well. Um, let me just turn then to the appendix, which has got the information in it, which I don't think uh, members have seen before in, the, in this format. And obviously it's something which we can refine and improve uh, and, and make sure that we've, we're bringing the information back in, a, in a, as an accessible way as possible. But it covers all the areas then of where the council is responding to members of the public, whether that's by complaints, subject access requests, uh, councillors' inquiries, of course, you're receiving them from members of the public, MP inquiries, and freedom of information requests. So you'll see there a range of um, information about our response and particularly about the timeliness of our response. And it's fair to say that I think we need to be very clear in the transparency of this information so that we can focus in on those areas which need to be improved for the timeliness of the response. And obviously, one of the major areas was the freedom of information requests because that had a very poor track record. It was the, uh, the cause of an, of an audit um, and a number of audit recommendations. And as a result of that, some activity has taken place around reorganization and new systems and staff, etc. So um, our overall performance in the year was um, pretty poor. If you're looking at paragraph 6.1, Note, of course, though, we did suspend the service in the first quarter in relation to the pandemic. So there is that pandemic effect. Doesn't really help us, though, to understand if we are improving. And then in 6.2, 6.3, you'll see that the FOI performance since the 1st of March to the 30th of June isn't really giving as much reassurance as we would like that things are on the uptick and in the right direction because, of course, um, that performance there is still stubbornly low at 60.5 and way off the 90% target, which we're talking about. So in preparation of these reports, with the manager concerned, we agreed we would have to break it down um, by month and by service area to hone in on where things were going wrong and where things weren't, um, where we had an opportunity for improvement. But actually in doing so, it really looks like we've had a problem in March more than anywhere else with the introduction of it beyond what we thought originally, because the overall statistics, um, when you break them down by month, they are now starting to show a really good improvement. So overall in April was 64%, May was 70% and June 
was 88%. So that's heading in the right direction. And within those breakdowns of statistics, we're looking at some departments that have got 90 and 91% return rates for various months. So we are now, I think, hopefully seeing the sort of green shoots of improvements in this area, which we need to make sure we sustain. So hopefully the new system embedding will work. The continued monitoring of these um, cases weekly in CMT will work. And we've also got some further recommendations and thoughts coming through in the a technical review, which is mentioned in the other report from the Leicester City Council review. So we will amalgamate all that and we will continue to bring information back so that you can see how we are progressing on those on those FOI re return rates, because that's a key that's a key issue for us. OK, thank you very much. I, I think a number of speakers want to speak to us. Are you keen to start? You seem to be usually keen to start. We'll, we'll point look, it all I just look keen. Any more keen than anyone else? I'm just... OK, um, sorry. Uh, thank you. Well, one of the questions I was going to ask was that if I sold you, or if I had bought first step uh, and uh, I found that in the first quarter of in implementation, like the performance had decreased, I probably wouldn't would be asking for, for firm step, some firm reparation. Uh, but you've just reassured us that, in fact, yeah, it is to do with the implementation and, and those figures for June look really good. So let's hope that that system is doing its job. That's great. Thanks very much. The, the other point, which is more of a question, is like um, uh, the paragraph on table five and table four. We we kind of um, we puzzled in our discussions about whether we've ever received these figures before and whether we actually asked asked for them. And I'm I'm just wondering. They they seem to be something that's coming new, uh, um, and whether it's really part of uh, information. It's uh, the, the sort of same ballpark thing as as as, as the, the the council's governance and management of information. The the, the uh, which is the the, the amount of com the number of complaints that have come for each area uh, it doesn't quite fit for me, uh, but I maybe can explain what, how that's come about. I, I don't know if you've seen well, that. It strikes me information governance doesn't, it's not unreasonable. What council members, are you going to explain? No, I wasn't going to offer an expl explanation, but I was just kind of going to add to the point in terms of um, it's quite helpful data, but I think given it's the first time we've seen it, it could be slightly refined so that we can see trends, etc., and scrutinise it because in its current form, it's quite difficult and um, Miss Graham helpfully explained regarding the FOIs but I suppose in terms of the complaints the same rule of thumb would apply you know we don't know because of COVID has there been more complaints than normal or you know comparing data um, and I found table 4.3 particularly confusing and I think it might be missing a heading and that's why but it would just be helpful I suppose to have more of a explanation so that perhaps if this tracks again we can dive deeper yes. into what it means. I, I, can I just make a comment and then, then ask? Yeah. I, I, mean, I agree with this in the sense that it's, it, it's complaint handling, certainly in certainly in certain sectors, retail, it's extremely important because obviously mm. it tells you how your organisation is performing, mm. it tells you where it's going wrong, mm. and then you obviously try and fix the complaints so that actually everything improves. And so almost the phraseology like, upheld or partially upheld almost implies it's adversarial it's a sort of a conflict yeah. which I suspect is not necessarily the case no. so you'll have some complaints obviously that you have to push back others actually that's really helpful to tell us thank you very much and we will you know change systems so I think that's something about sort of actually what can we learn from this yeah. and if it is new perhaps perhaps we devote a little sort of section to it at a forthcoming meeting yeah i'm very happy with that chairman i mean um in discussion with the the managers concerned it didn't seem right that this information wasn't exposed to sort of councillors so they could understand it it is quite difficult to get your head around some of the um statistics and the trends because of course some in some um complaints which start in here don't finish in the year so they don't the numbers don't equally add up um, doesn't make it easy to sort of get your head around um, the performance of it so we can look at if there's better ways of reporting it and also as well um, it would help to sort of be able to um, go into some of these particular areas to find out well what does that mean in terms of our performance and what's happening as a result of it now where we have complaints which are upheld um, managers are required to um, write a short report about what is happening as a result of that 
area mm. and that information isn't coming in here it, I don't think it's actually going anywhere particularly meaningful but one of the things I've discussed with the managers concerned in that area is that given that we've now got a sort of solid um, staffing arrangement for that area we should now be trying to grab hold of this information to say well what is it telling us and how can we use it for exactly. the improvement of the council services overall yeah. so how we bring it back and how we use it has got to be something which we, we start right. and then progress with so one of the first actions obviously is to bring it to light and to say here, here it is uh, allow members the opportunity to express their um, yeah. their concerns and where they would like to see it go but we will continue to develop it to make sure we've got the information coming through and particularly that we can dive into some of these areas and provide a bit of a richer picture about what's happening. Good. I like the fact also you get compliments received and you recall that as well so it's not all doom and gloom there's uh there's a positives as well and that's um and again that tells you something as well of course okay um so councillor robinson did you want to sort of do not i thought you wanted to speak about um data security and uh training have they okay well next, please do chair if i can just add to um what mr graham has um just indicated um, CMT the corporate management team um, get a regular report from um, the team that pulls together all of this data um, and certainly um, the uh, customer contact center are actively tr uh, tracking all of the complaints and queries that come into the contact center to actually understand um, whether um, services can be improved and, and what's coming in as what we call demand failure because um, something that should have happened hasn't happened and therefore um, how do we address that so so certainly um, within uh, the, the customer uh, fulfillment team there is that piece of work uh, going on which dovetails with this and indeed in terms of the freedom of information um, information coming in um, there is uh, the constant uh, review to try and see what better information we could put on the council's internet um, so that we can simply divert people to there and I do know that um, you know responses to freedom of information requests are now posted on the website so we can um, uh, forward people to that source of information because I, I think the other interesting thing uh, for members is it, it kind of exposes the volume of queries one way or another that are coming into the council and these queries very often um, sit in a few areas of the council which means from both a management perspective but also from a member perspective that is um, a, a real call on certain officer areas time yeah. so so if I was to give an example we get an awful lot of queries in relation to council tax particularly we also get a lot of queries around parking um, we get a lot of queries at the moment around waste um, etc so so the services that are pressured um, tend to be a handful right. um, but we get an awful lot of queries in those areas but then you know that so if the information is in relatively available relatively that's right. available, you point them straight to yeah, it so, so that's called if you want an explanation of something they're yeah. not criticizing this as i just don't understand yeah actually uh, as related to that i was going to say that um i do think it's really valuable information actually and it gets to kind of like tells us what through the front door what people are saying about it so you might no, no, I, I always did. It, I suppose I, should, I want to clarify the fact that I, I think the, the context would be helpful. So, for example, service changes are going to drive inquiries and complaints very often. Like we've just, you know, rolled out food waste recycling, right? Well, there's a whole, you know, that it's disruptive and therefore people are going to probably not, you know, some are going to be happy, others are going to be uh, less happy. And, you know, so this this is the kind of I feel this is raw information uh, a little bit refined and a little bit more context would make it really valuable information is yeah. what I'm saying I, I think what what has happened in the past that we first of all said this would be a good idea to have this stuff 
come forward, it's transparent, that's really helpful. And we did this with the audit um, actions tracker, didn't we? In the first report, it was a bit difficult to follow. It was refined, it was improved. And so iteratively, it becomes a better and better report, more and more useful, I think, to yourselves as well, isn't it? So I think the first thing is get it on the table. And then now, how can we then really sort of bring it to life? Um, but I think it's very helpful. It, so it's worth just because I mean, Councillor Robinson mentioned that, that in terms of the cyber security training, I mean, OK, so I think quite a few councillors still need to uh, step forward and, and leave, leave from the front. Um, hopefully nobody here is in, in, in the naughty corner. Um, absolutely not. Yeah, that's, that's good to hear. In terms of officers, and I, I think I've asked this question before, quite what we mean by officers, because I think you also talk about frontline staff, grounds. Now, does office include every last council? Because clearly a number of frontline staff probably don't need it. Is the training tailored? So if you're in this particular role, clearly you need the full package. If you're out, I don't know, sort of mowing lawns, you probably don't need some of the more sort of um, very much IT stuff, but you do need to think about sort of physical security. Yes, the answer is no. Um, unfortunately, it isn't because the module that we've got is a it's similar to the one that members have seen um, and it is for it's for all officers and it's just been delivered. So the work which is going on about trying to split out where those officers are uh, and what number of them we're talking about who just have access to say something like um, uh, an office.com or an email only I've still got some connection to these council systems, but haven't got sort of full daily desktop access. We need to understand that yeah. because clearly for some of those people, we may say, well, actually, we're still expecting you to do the full cybersecurity because you could click on a link in an email. However, for others, if there are other staff where we do need to have a tailored um, approach, then we need to put that tailored approach into place. And it's not beyond the wit and wisdom of officers internally to put that together because we're talking about a discrete group of staff, there are a big discrete number of things that we want to tell them, which you can pretty much sort of take from the training package, which we've currently got and deliver it in a, in a more focused way. But we just need to be absolutely clear the number of people and where they are and what we're talking to them about so that we can actually say we've got it covered off. So it's as a result of doing this sort of scrutiny of the yeah. numbers and focusing in, well, what what actually are our numbers and who are we talking about that this issue has come to light? OK, so exactly, so you're on it now. So I said, yeah. my film has a very, very similar process. It's three or four questions at the beginning. Are you in this role? Are you in tax? Are you in audit? Whatever. Yeah. Yes, no, yes. And to pay on only about four or five questions, you need to do modules one, two, six and nine, yeah. or you need to do everything or whatever. Yeah. And therefore it's tailored. So therefore, frankly, you're not asking overwhelming people with, cause it, it took a while, wasn't it? So sort of two or three hours, I think I seem to recall in bits no i can't remember it wasn't a quick sort of five minute job and so some of these people will really get quite quite stressed by it if they're, if they're not familiar with using them the whole time um so so that, yes so that's good to hear that that's going to be focused on Councillor brock um Councillor brock please speak thank you chair um just on the cyber security training i mean I, i've taken uh, a particular interest in ensuring that councillors in my group get it done and I'm really pleased that the vast majority have there remain a few people who still need to do it and I'll work with the, the chief whip of my group to ensure that they do um, candidly I think if, if I were a councillor and hadn't done it by now I'd be very embarrassed that I hadn't done it by now we've had plenty of time to do it it doesn't take that long I think it took me about 30 to 45 minutes to do it uh, it's a useful process but it's not be it's not the most complex thing in the world uh, but it's good to be alerted to obvious errors obvious flaws uh, that, that people can make uh, in terms of cyber security so I'll go away and make sure that any councillors who still haven't started or completed the process in my group um, do so and I'm sure other groups will be doing the same uh, just to hammer that point home, even Councillor Gul Khan, who's not renowned for being <laughs> the most IT savvy of individuals, has completed the cyber security training. On the point that's being made about uh, the corporate complaints data and so on, I just wanted to sort of point out that what that doesn't capture, I suppose, is the number of complaints that are resolved through councillor inquiries. I mean, separately here, we have the data on councillor inquiries. Um, which is, is very helpful and, and particularly useful with the breakdown by directorate. Uh, but clearly a lot of complaints that actually come in will come, and indeed a lot of compliments, 
will come direct to councillors and then will be absorbed in that process rather than the corporate complaints process. So I do think it's something we should be mindful of if we're trying to make use of that data to inform us and to allow us to um, have a, a useful debate and be able to sort of analyse areas where we're doing well and areas where we may be falling a bit short. And I think it will require a bit more thought about how we integrate those two streams of information. And I think the point that the Deputy Chief Executive makes is, is really pertinent as well, that those inquiries and complaints and indeed compliments are not falling evenly at all across the council. I mean, the vast majority relate to DENs because they're the universal service provision, but obviously that's a, a minority of the council's budget. And I think we need to be quite conscious of that fact that the people are going to respond to, um, inquire about, complain about, pass comment about the services that they use in that sort of that everybody uses as universal services uh, rather than those ones which are a bit more specific like children's services and adult social care and that needs to be reflected I think in the way that we resource this kind of work as well but I just wanted to pick up on that point because I think disaggregating counsellor inquiries and complaints although necessary for this kind of data presentation exercise doesn't really give us the full picture of what people are saying and how people are engaging with the services that the council provides. And it's gonna require quite a lot more thought, I think, to bring that data together cogently and coherently to allow members of this committee uh, to have a, a fruitful discussion and debate about it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Brock. Um, I think we're all done on that, are we? I think we are. So we're asked to note progress to date, some future action um, actions outline the report, which we've done, identify matters of interest for future reports. I think we've also done as well. So that's quite very helpful. So thank you very much, Mr. Graham. OK, so we've done that. So our next one, we are on to item eight, which is the annual Treasury Management Review. Um, Councillor McCune, you're going to introduce us and talk us through it. So is that right? No? Oh, sorry, I must, I must have been misunderstood the brief. So, to apologize. so who's going to do this? I've, I've got Thanks, Stuart mate. Donnelly, but I think it's going to be Mr. Carter by a little bit. It is, yes. Yeah. Stuart's on leave in Scotland this week. I hope he's enjoying the weather. Um, so this report reviews the Treasury management activity that took place during the 2021 financial year and is produced in accordance with the Treasury management strategy approved by Council in February 2020. The Council's underlying need to borrow is termed the Capital Financing Requirement or CFR. As at 31st of March 21, our CFR stood at £591.5 million. Our borrowing, including PFI at that point, stood at £419.7 million, meaning that we are underborrowed by £171 million. A short term loan of £10 million was drawn down for a month in May 2020 to assist in managing the cash flow position of the council, but no long term loans were taken out during the year. The council did not experience any significant cash flow difficulties arising from COVID-19. The Treasury management budget held in the general fund uh, ended the year with a small underspend of 28k and the council didn't breach any of its Treasury management performance indicators in the year. Um, members are asked to note the report and I'm asked, happy to take any questions. OK, do we have any comments? Um, Traditionally, this was that we used to receive a monster report about this. It was extremely complicated and we all sort of floundered around and uh, had lots of questions. One from me is I, I used to remember, I think it was Arlene Close, the investment manager, used to come along and give us a report. But do we still use them? And, and, and if we do, you know, how do we use them? We use Link as our Treasury Management Advisors and we do use them to help inform our Treasury Management decisions and in the Treasury Management Report, as that's included as part of the budget report, they'll provide their assessment of the of the current climate in terms of Treasury Management. OK. Um, um, 
Anybody else? Go on, Candle Davis, you pile in. Um, on page, page 96, um, the third column Sorry. says maturity rate, and it's got these years listed. Can you explain what they are? You, probably so I didn't quite so. you might understand them better than me. So in the on, on page 96, Appendix 1, borrowing portfolio. Um, so again, I haven't got... I've got seven of fourteen. So what? What paragraph number? Uh, there isn't. A, it isn't a paragraph number. It's an appendix one. Appendix one. Well, I mean, obviously, don't ask me, but um, ask. It says the lender PWLB most of them and uh, start date and maturity date. I just wondered what the maturity date actually signified because they're all in the in the past. What they actually mean? The great. That's a very good question. They're so in the future, so I see. Right, okay. So they're twenty sixty two and twenty. Yes, yes. Uh, that's ah. that yeah. is correct. So, yeah. so the first one, for example, was a loan taken out on the first yeah. of October twenty nineteen, and it matures on the second of October uh, twenty sixty two. Yes. You can ask the question at the time when it matures. When you, <laughs> yeah, I think we just got through that. Well, but it was just the first one we just finished paying off, isn't it? Um, yeah, a very long term. I mean, the other thing I remember five or six years back at least, again, in Arlene Close was saying how extraordinary that, that, that uh, interest rates were so extraordinarily low. This was a blip, no way they were going to return back to normal levels. And here we are, sort of. 2021 and still extraordinarily low. It seems extraordinary. It's just, it is historically, I think, the lowest, the lowest for the longest period, absolutely abnormal. And the fear, of course, is that at some point they start to go back up, but but it doesn't seem to be happening. Okay, so I mean, I, we always, I find it is difficult to follow some of this stuff, but the reassuring thing is that we seem to be in a good place. It doesn't, I mean, in a sense, pleasure rate shouldn't be exciting, contentious. It should be fairly straightforward. That seems to be where it is. Yes, Chair. Um, I don't know if Mr Carter wants to comment on um, the the Council's MRP policy in its general sense, which plays to um, the length of the loans we take out and aligning how we align and decide how, how those uh, the length of those loans. Yes, yeah, so the MRP policy bases the charge to the revenue account on the asset lives of the assets that we've got. And a lot of our assets, of course, will have very long asset lives. So it's reasonable in those circumstances to take out loans over a long period of time, especially when we think about our council housing stock. These assets will be of value to the people of Reading for decades to come. OK, yeah. OK, so all we are asked to do again is note this report. So thank you very much. Noted. Um, now, the suggestion is that was eight, item eight. The suggestion is we now take um, items nine and 11 together. So we go to item nine first, um, closing the final accounts update. I've got down Annette to speak on this one. Annette, or I think it will be me. OK, you go. Annette wrote the report. Um, so members of Aud Audit and Governance Committee may recall that in April I said that we hope to complete the audit work on the 1819 accounts by the end of April 21. Well, while it took longer than I'd originally hoped, I'm extremely happy to inform you that the, our officers have now completed all of the outstanding work and that a revised statement of accounts reflecting all amendments uh, agreed as part of the audit was handed over to our external auditors Ernst and Young on the 9th of July. Later on this agenda EY will pre be presenting their draft audit, re uh, audit results report so I won't say any more about the 1819 accounts until we hear from EY. Work is also well underway on updating the 1920 statement of accounts with the aim of handing over the draft statements at the end of July, ready for the audit to start in August. And a timetable is also in place to produce the draft 2021 statement. 
So members are asked to note the progress made in relation to the audit of the 1819 accounts and that these accounts will be circulated to the committee at the conclusion of the audit. I also ask members to delegate to me in con consultation with the chairman the authority to sign off the statement of accounts for 1819 on behalf of the council. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions, but we may want to wait until we've heard EY's report first. OK, thank you very much. Councillor McCord, do you want to speak at this point or do you want to wait until after the EY report? I'm happy to wait until after the EY report. OK. Um, so hopefully people have read this and so I'm, I'm very pleased to say we're obviously making good progress and we're accelerating as well in terms of 1819, 1920 and so on, which is great. OK, so we're happy to note that. And then what we'll now do is move to item 11, which obviously follows on. Um, so EY, it's Maria, I think, is going to speak on this. Thank Hello. you, Chairman. Hi, thank you. Yes, if I if I start, then I'll hand over to Adrian. Um, <clears throat> so I just wanted to set a little bit of context to start. Um, so we are at the at the last stages of um, getting to the point of signing the 2018-19 statements. Um, for members, I just wanted to set out where we are with regards to progress on those areas of qualification. Um, members that were around on the committee um, uh, last time we presented um, to a set of your statements, it was the 1718 statements and we had um, uh, a number of um, areas of qualification within those. So just to be absolutely clear, where we've got to is we have qualifications on the opening balances um, on um, creditors and uh, pensions and that's purely because we had qualifications on the closing balances yeah. in 1718. Um, we also have um, a qualification around the fact that in order to clear out balances um, there have been um, items transferred um, through your um, INE basically so through your income statement and as a result of that, we have um, qualification um, covering that matter. So when we move forward to next year, there should just be the con comparative um, period qualifications coming through next year. So having spoken to the committee over the years and talked about the fact that we want to see these qualifications reducing, um, this is a really positive picture. We do have, we have had final information back from the council on some final testing and we're just um, looking at um, looking at that information and then tying up all of our file um, for final reviews sign off. Um, and as we do that, we will be able to finalise the auditor's opinion. Um, but at this stage um, to have moved forward to opening um, opening balance qualifications with just that qualification of anything flowing through income statement is a really yeah. positive step forward um, and it is a, a significant step forward to ending up with a clean set of accounts. On the um, value for money conclusion, again, um, because the value for money conclusion sits as at the end of March um, uh, in that particular year, so the 31st of March 2019, um, there are still going to be uh, matters ar arising from the point of view of uh, controls and we've heard earlier about um, control account reconciliations and, and um, controls around balances from internal audit and there will also be recommendations around um, children's services within this value for money uh, conclusion and matters arising there. However, again, we've seen a lifting of um, matters and concerns and qualification around the financial standing of the council which which was a significant part of my section 2472 report um, uh, a, a couple of years ago. So, so that's a, a further improvement that we've seen on the value for money conclusion. So it's it's um, it's still a qualified report, but it's moving in the right direction. Um, and we do raise a number of recommendations within our report. Um, and I think at that point, I'll probably hand over to Adrian just to bring out some of the detail in our report, please, for members, Adrian, if you would. Yeah, thanks, Maria. So uh, just taking the committee through some of the, the findings of the report. So we start on the executive summary, uh, which we detail on pages 125 to 128 of the report. 
Uh, just a few things to note. Uh, so one is on the materiality. So we're just giving an update in terms of our materiality thresholds. Uh, you will see in there that we had to reduce our materi materiality as a result of um, a large error we found within uh, the children's uh, line within the income and expenditure statement, uh, where effectively there was uh, a large number of items which were effectively grossed up, um, resulting in errors on both income and expenditure, so both being overstated. So as a result of that, we did reduce our materiality. and We needed to kind of consider the impact of that in our testing. Um, as a result of that, we did pick a number of additional items to test and we're happy to conclude that uh, su subject to final review, we don't have any significant concerns from that, but that's just an update on uh, our materiality. We also kind of detail some of the additional work we've had to do around COVID-19. Uh, so similar to last year's um, accounts, there are a number of additional disclosures within the accounts um, and, a and a significant amount of additional disclosure around going concern. So we have spent a lot of time with officers uh, reviewing key documentation around medium term financial plans, uh, risk assessments on COVID, uh, cash flow stress testing, uh, looking at that and also looking particularly at the impact on the subsidiaries as well. Um, so that's kind of been a key part of our work. Um, and again, we're coming to conclusion on that and that will be going through the internal con consultation. Just moving through uh, the rest of the report on pages 130 to 137. Uh, we detail uh, the findings of our work around significant risks and other areas of audit focus. Again, uh, we touch on some of the detail in there and some of the work we've done on lifting the areas of qualification, which is kind of a real positive from where we were this time last year. Um, on pages 139 to 144 um, is our draft audit opinion as it currently stands. Um, so that pulls out the qualifications that Marie has just referenced and also touches on the qualification on the value for money as well. Uh, in terms of pages uh, 146 to 148, you'll see we've listed um, a large number of audit differences we've had, which are material. They've all been corrected by the council on page 146. And on pages 148, we have a small number which are uncorrected, but which aren't material for us. So uh, we're happy to leave them as uncorrected and not needing to be put through the accounts. Pages 150 to 154 really pulls out uh, some detail of the value for money conclusion and our final conclusions on that. Uh, and then on pages 159 to 169 is the control environment findings. A lot of those, um, so they're split into two. So one is the kind of follow up from the 2017-18 recommendations. And then on um, the latter pages, we touch on the findings in 2018-19, a number of which actually are very consistent with uh, the reports from the internal audit and have been for a number of years. Um, so again, we just asked management for um, some uh, uh, recommendations in terms of how they're going to take those forward into uh, ensuring that um, any of the issues noted have been mitigated. Um, then on pages 177 to 178, we just confirm our independence again. Uh, 179, we give an update on the fees position for current year as well. And then the last uh, couple of appendices on uh, pages 188, appendix D, and uh, appendix E on pages 188 to 193 are the current status of what's outstanding. And again, as Maria said, we're coming into the final stages of our review, so no extensive testing left to do. And it's kind of going through all of the major amendments to the accounts and making sure that they all tie through. Um, and then on page 188 to 193, we set out the draft letter of representation, which uh, we'll be asking um, the committee to delegate on behalf of the committee to Councillor Stevens and also Darren in section 151. Uh, so that's all I'm happy to say and happy to take any questions. OK, um, I mean, obviously, those of us who have followed this story over the last three, four, five years, it's been very rewarding to see how, how things have come on so far and how much better it is now and you know, a light at the end of the tunnel, clearly, which is good. Um, anybody in the room? No, Councillor McIlroy, I think you wish to speak. Hi, uh, thanks. Um, thanks to everyone for the work. I know I'm a Johnny come lately to this topic, so I've still got all this enthusiasm and excitement to, yeah. um, to see it play out and have a lot of catching up to do. So I think I think the officers are taking the time to explain that to me as well. Um, I have a really boring point to make on process just before we um, just before I, I make my comment, which is around just three hours before this meeting started, the agenda was updated asking us to authorise the sign off. Um, of the statement of accounts for 2018-19 on behalf of the councillors uh, on behalf of the council and the, the officers were kind enough to give me a last minute briefing and and I, I now understand this is about agility and us getting the work done in a timely way that allows us to feed into those 2019-20 accounts but I just wanted to say I guess in, in principle I protested 
at request for authorization being added um, just before the meeting. Um, I don't know if, if any, any if you want to comment on that at all, um, Chair, before I get to my point. Um, I was just going to see what actually we were asked. To... So we need to be so this this the director of finance in consultation with the chair of the auditing government is authorized to sign off the statement of accounts on behalf of the council so i'm guessing what we're saying is that this committee has been delegated by the full council to, to make that decision is that right um and i'm just slightly curious were we not expecting this because it was it's normally something we see annually so is, it, is there any reason why it sort of came in late? And when we sign up the accounts, but obviously signed up two accounts in uh, it's yeah. easier way because it doesn't fit in with the committee cycle. Um, so the dedication is usually made to the director in consultation with the chair. Yeah. So for your comfort, Councillor Kimmel, this is something we do annually and have done for as long as I remember. Um, quite why it came late is there's probably some sort of a timing issue but it, I don't think it's particularly um, unusual or strange that we're asked to do this it's a success it didn't, didn't concern me in any way yeah. Yeah. yeah just to confirm it's the same delegation that was used in the 2017-18 accounts so the same request was made to audit committee in October 2020 Right. Um, chairs, so if I can just um, perhaps provide uh, a bit of an explanation. Um, effectively, because um, we're playing catch up with the accounts um, and the timing of when those are available for signing didn't necessarily correlate with the meeting of a committee, um, we weren't able to bring the, the final opinion and, and the final um, statement as approved to this particular meeting delaying it until the autumn um i don't think is anything that members would wish and certainly not yeah. something officers would wish so from an expediency perspective just seeking that delegation clearly the audit will have been completed um our external auditors are happy to sign off it is it is whether this committee is happy to delegate that formal sign off that has to happen to the chair and to the director of finance and then that uh, report will be published um, on the council's website and can be circulated to members um, as soon as it's it's uh, done and just to be clear what's actually being what we're doing if you go right to the very end um so it's appendix e correct me if again i'm wrong so you'll see a management representation letter um, and so we're sort of making a number of representations to the auditor. I think that is what we're signing off, if I'm not correct. Um, it, it's actually um, the there is a, 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 a front sheet, if you like, in, in the statement. Um, Darren can probably um, quote uh, chapter and verse, but but it's it's not quite the letter of rep. Uh, yeah, it's the statement of responsibility section of the statement of accounts requires both of our signatures. OK. Right. OK. Yeah. Happy. Anybody else? Any other comments? OK. <coughs> yes. OK. All right. Um, just voting. Yeah, well, if there were no other comments on that, I'll, I'll make just on voting. My... Just yeah. voting in favour. OK, good. Right. All in favour? Do you want to take a vote? Well, Councillor McElroy can't vote. <laughs> yeah. So you want to speak to somebody else, Juice? You want to have another comment? Yeah, I was going to, I was going to say that the second point I had on, on just following up on this. Um, right. Um, um, so obviously earlier at item four, I noted my concerns about um, fraud risks arising from things like the ongoing reconciliations issues with BFFC, um, but that's flogging a dead horse. So I'll, I'll leave that from there. I think um, I also suspect that a lot of my concerns and um, what not will probably be soothed, um, or at least I, I suspect or I hope they will once we see that management response to the auditor's concerns that the director of finance was mentioning as well. Um, and I guess I, I, it would be great to just hear from um, from from the the officers or or the chair 
um, what the next steps will be for us to scrutinise um, the final accounts for 2018-19. Um, I understand that means that they, even though we're, we're, we're agreeing to this, they will still come to a, a future um, a future committee and we'll, we'll get to scrutinise them in, in full. Yeah. Who, who wants to respond? Um, Chair, if I might, and, and um, the Director of Finance may want to come in. Um, the, the accounts at the point they are, have, are signed have been scrutinised. They, there is a, um, during the period of the audit, there is a statutory period of 30 days over which any member of uh, the public um, can come in and look at um, the working papers, uh, can review the statement and make representations to the auditors. Um, but once that period has passed, um, there is no further opportunity to inspect the accounts. And effectively by signing off on the audit, the auditors are saying to the council, we have reviewed all of these working papers and, and are content, given all of our work in this area and the sampling and everything else that has gone on, that they are a true and fair view. Um, and so, so no, they wouldn't be available for inspection or review, if you like. They will clearly be available for people to look at and, and um, revert to, but not for review. So not for well, scrutiny. Yes, yeah, so there's different words being used. Essentially, you'll yeah, yeah. be able to see, you have had a chance to see the, the accounts as presented to the auditor. Auditor obviously gives their opinion. You'll have you'll be able to see the final audit report and the final audited accounts for sure, public documents. And there's nothing to stop you asking questions about those. But as Mr. Yates says, the period in which you could actually challenge the actual numbers going into the accounts that that's passed. Happy? OK, so we are, we're going to we are we actually going to vote on something here. <laughs> we're getting very excited. Um, so, so pardon? He can't, but we can't. Not I'm, me, I'm, I'm not was, voting. <laughs> he's been looking forward to all evening to having a chance to vote for me to sign these accounts, I think. Is that the idea? All those in favour, please raise your hands. Anybody against? It's carried unanimously, Mr Popham. We're <laughs> thrilled by that one. Um, OK, so that's... Um, we've done then item 9 and 11, so finally then it's item 10, which is the implementation of the audit tracker. Um, again, Mrs. H, you're going to introduce us, I think. Yes, so... Sorry, Chair, yes. Um, so this is um, the usual format of the audit tracker report, um, providing an update on progress with the outstanding uh, recommendations arising from audits that haven't yet been implemented fully. Um, since the last meeting, um, 20 of the previously reported completed recommendations have been removed from the tracker um, and 15 new ones in line with uh, the internal audit reports in the intervening period have been added. Um, you can see at table 4.7 um, that um, how how the uh, recommendations break down both in terms of number on the tracker so there are 117 in total um, and 19 are currently reporting as complete with a further 34 as green 10 red and 54 amber and in terms of trends um, the chart at para 4.9 shows um, the trend and um, positively, um, we are seeing um, a sustained reduction um, since uh, March in terms of um, the, sorry, yes, in, I think it's March, um, in terms of the number of um, red recommendations reducing. Um, and clearly there's more work to be done, but um, positive in that regard. I'm happy to take. No, it's all going to pull. We're sorely missing Councillor McKenna at this point because he he was our. Thanks for calling Councillor McKenna. 
he, he was he he was a sort of tracker hawk, wasn't he? That used to sort of sw um, soar high and swoop low. Um, could just just for my benefit, and I make a comment. Just remind me what red, amber, green meant. Didn't it? Was it about the importance of the recommendation? And the other thing I think is worth saying to to if it didn't wasn't to remember this or aware. The recommendations are agreed with um, management. It's not they're not contentious. They're not being imposed upon managers. Managers have agreed these, so that there should be no fundamental resistance to implementing them. It's just obviously the practicality of doing it. So hopefully, one we should see a sort of an open door and, and the movement happening you know, fairly sort of fluidly. Yeah. Um, yes, that's correct, Chair. So all of the recommendations have had a management response and the audits um, have been um, signed off as completed and, and agreed between the um, internal audit um, section and the service um, that was being um, audited. Um, and you can see the responsible officer um, in the header um, for each of the um, recommendations. So moving down um, column, the eighth column in from the left shows you the responsible officer. And effectively, it's that officer's uh, role to make sure that the, the individual recommendations are implemented and they provide an update against progress. In terms of the RAG rating, yep. the RAG rating um, doesn't reflect the severity of the recommendation or the importance of the recommendation. Rather, it, rec it um, reflects the degree to which the recommendation is being implemented. So if, if more than 76% of the activity to, to implement a recommendation has been um, implemented, it will show right. as green. And so it's in power of 4 3, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Yeah. It is. Okay. Yeah. I mean, th these recommendations are fixing things that are identified in, uh, in, in previous audits. So, um, you know, it, it, there's a lot of detail here, and our detailed man is uh, not mm. with you anymore. We didn't need a new one. Um, but on the whole, what we like to see is a flow through of stuff from audit findings, recommendations. The fact you've got recommendations and they're agreed with management is a success in itself because otherwise you'd be going, this is wrong. I don't really know why and I don't know how to fix it. Well, actually, no, we, we know how to fix it. We've written it down. We're tracking it. Things are coming off. Things are going on. It's when you start to see a log jam of the, the red recommendations growing that it looks like uh, we've got a problem in you know, someone's come up with recommendations, but they're not actually implementable, either because of resource or they're not feasible or whatever. That that would be a that would be a, a concern for us, a red flag. Uh, seeing the numbers of reds declining, albeit there's a little blip in March to June, but you know, much better figures than from 19. Um, I think that's reassuring that 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 things are happening and flowing through. Um, for me, anyway. I think Zach's exactly right. Because um, I think the issue, the genesis of this was that in some years past, Mr. Harrington was duly doing his audits, jolly good, he making recommendations, and then frankly, not much was happening. And it, it wasn't even fobbed off, they just simply weren't really responding. So it's all a bit, well, what's the point of this? What's the value of it? So the point was to capture it like this. They, the management commit to making those recommendations or if they don't think it's doable then they would say so at that point once they've committed to doing it then hopefully it's all going to happen and i think it's for his team frankly it's a much more worthwhile exercise um, and also of course over time the whole organization should improve stage by stage and to just to add to that is that some of these things get re-audited don't they and revisited and uh you know ultimately when you go back and re-audit something and you find that it, it's actually improved yeah. because you carried through the management actions that you identified to carry through. So that's the ultimate thing is yeah. that, you know, thing, we, we revisit these things and they're OK now. Well, and, and that's the other point about the time of it. So we've got one or two things, you know, back in 17, but they shouldn't be too sticky. They should be on there for a period and then go there. We shouldn't see stuff sitting there for sort of months or years on end, hopefully. But again, thoroughly accept this last year has been <laughs> about as challenging as it can get. Council, uh, 
That was going to be my comment actually, Chair, you've alluded to it, is actually previously when we've looked at these, a lot of the top, the, one, the, the ones that are older have been red or amber, you know, anecdotally speaking, from what I recall in the table, and actually a lot of those are now green, and it's actually mm. um, the more recent ones that have been added, the amber and red. So I think, you know, there has been a focus, clearly, we can see through this on those older historic ones, and it's about keeping the pressure in the more recent ones. Yep, absolutely. Any more? We're all happy. Okay, excellent. Um, I didn't see what we said so we do, but I'm guessing we're going to note. We're, we're considering it in this time. We, we, we vote to consider. We have duly considered. <laughs> excellent. Okay, so I think that then brings us to the end of the agenda. So thank you very much, everybody present. Thank you very much, everybody attending uh, remotely. Thank you, officers. Thank you, Ernst Young, for coming along as ever and uh, contributing. So much appreciated. Thank you all. Good night. <laughs>